My dear, dear students, colleagues, and all the viewers who are watching this program live from Facebook page and YouTube channel, I would like to welcome you all to our International Physics Webinar. Good evening to all here in Bangladesh and a very good afternoon to all those who are watching this program live from UK. Hope you are well and safe from Corona pandemic. Today, it's our 131 International Physics Webinar. So we are trying to adjust with this new normal situation. So we cannot continue our normal academic program inside the campus. Uh, so uh, we have to start our on online program. I think you have already come to know that the Department of Physics, Pabna University of Science and Technology has started its online program, including online international physics webinar. We have successfully completed our 130 international physics webinar, including two Nobel laureate speakers. So uh, we are trying to motivate our students uh, and encourage our students in this corona pandemic situation. So today, I would like to welcome you all to a joint session between Department of Physics, Pabna University of Science and Technology and the Department of Physics, King's College, London, UK in physics. And we have with us here today, uh, Dr. John Ellis, sir, CBE, FRS Professor, Clark uh, Maxwell Professor of Theoretical Physics, Department of Physics, King's College, London, UK. And he has already connected with us. So I'd like to welcome our speaker, sir. Uh, good afternoon and good evening here. So thanks for accepting our invitation, sir. Hello, so yes, like, pleased to be back again. So uh, for those uh, uh, who are new, I'd like to introduce that uh, we have divided our uh, webinar into three parts. First of all, we'd like to uh, introduce our speaker with all of you, and then our speaker will deliver his piece. And then, at the end, we have a discussion session. In that time, anybody can join with us. So I think you have already come to know the title of this uh, today's webinar, and it's a very interesting uh, title. And important too. The title is The Supernova, The Matters of Life and Death. And our speaker is Dr. John Ellis Sir, CBE, FRS, Professor Max, Clark Maxwell, Professor of Theoretical Physics, Department of Physics, King's College London, UK. And we can see his academic and uh, professional career. So after completing his secondary education at uh, Highgate School, he attended King's College uh, uh, Cambridge, earning his PhD in Theoretical Physics, uh, Particle Physics in 1971. Uh, after deep postdoc, position at Slack and Caltech. He went to CERN and uh, has held an uh, indefinite contract there since 1978. He was awarded the Maxwell Medal and the Paul Dirac Prize by the Institute of Physics in 1982 and 2005, respectively, and is an elected fellow of the Royal Society of London since 1985 and, uh, and of the Institute of Physics in 1991. He was uh, awarded honorary uh, doctorate from the University of Southampton and uh, uh, twi twice won the first prize of the Gravity Research Foundation essay competition in 1999 and 2005. He also honorary doctorate from Uppsala University. Ellis' activities at CERN are wide ranging. He was twice a deputy division leader for the theory division and served as a division leader for 1982 to 1994. He was a founding member of the LEPC and of the LACC. Currently, he is chair of the committee of the investigate physics opportunities for future proton accelerator and is a member of the extended click compact linear collider steering committee. Ellis was appointed commander of the order of the British Empire CV in the 2012 Bardo honors for services to science and technology. A research interest, John's primary research is on particle physics beyond the standard model, but he also strays into related areas of the high energy astrophysics and cosmology. Within particle physics, he is particularly interested in prediction for collider experiment and the interpretation of their results. And his interest in astrophysics and cosmology include dark matter and strategies to detect it, as well as uh, dark energy and cosmological inflation. Mass of his research concerns supersymmetry, which he considered to be one of the most promising possible extension of the standard model. And he is actively working on the searches for supersymmetry particle at the LAC and astrophysical dark matter. He is also interested in models of quantum gravity, particularly those derived from the string theory, and is looking for possible experimental probes of such model, either in accelerator experiment or in high energy astrophysics and cosmology. We can see his uh, page in uh, Higgs Center for Theoretical Physics and his uh, list of publication and Wikipedia. So thanks for all of your questions. So now it's time to go to our speaker, sir. Uh, I'd like to welcome you again. Thanks for accepting for the third time. So uh, it's uh, your time, sir. You can start your session, sir. Okay, well, thank you very much. 
So uh, it's a pleasure to be back. It's your effort. So uh, as uh, you mentioned in the introduction, I, I'm primarily a particle physicist, uh, but I also uh, play around with topics in uh, astrophysics. And it's a topic in astrophysics that I want to discuss with you today. So uh, my title is uh, Supernovae, uh, Matters of, of Life and Death. So what I'm going to do is just uh, briefly discuss uh, how supernovae originate, how they die, and then what implications they could possibly have on Earth, and what evidence do we have that supernovae have had some influence on Earth's history. So th this is a topic that I've been interested in for uh, over 25 years now. But uh, just recently, uh, this became a, a big topic. Uh, for example, there was this uh, uh, cover article in Science magazine a few years ago uh, talking about the Earth having been barraged by supernovae millions of years ago and debris from supernova being found on the moon. And uh, that's much of what I want to talk to you about uh, in this lecture. So uh, here is uh, the aftermath of a uh, typical supernova explosion, uh, which took place when a star in the middle there in that little bright whitish area uh, collapsed and threw its energy out in the form of uh, matter and energetic particles. And what I'm going to argue is that among the stuff that comes out of a supernova, is a particular form of iron, which is radioactive. Uh, it's an isotope with the uh, atomic weight 60. And I'm going to present to you evidence that this radioactive iron isotope has been found on Earth, presumably due to a nearby supernova explosion about two and a half million years ago. So I will uh, discuss that and I will discuss uh, whether other supernova explosions in the past might have caused mass extinctions on Earth. So let's just recall uh, the uh, life and supernova death of a massive star. So supernovae originate from massive stars weighing more than eight times the mass of the sun. Typically, these are born in cold dust clouds where the uh, dust uh, coagulates under the force of gravity, clusters. And uh, in the picture in the upper right, you can see a couple of examples of uh, young stars that have just been born. Those are the bright blue spots there. Uh, these stars often form in uh, binaries, but I won't into that in this talk. So once a star has been born, its life is a struggle against gravity. So gravity is trying to make it collapse, but the star keeps on living by generating outward pressure generated by the energy released in nuclear fusion in the core. So in the uh, lower left picture, you can see uh, the interior of a massive star. And uh, you see that it's layered rather like an onion uh, with various different elements getting heavier as you go in towards the middle. So it can fuse light elements to make heavier elements. But once it gets to iron, it gets stuck because iron is the most strongly bound atomic nucleus. So when you start forming an iron core, you run out of fuel and there's no more pressure against gravity and the star collapses. Now, when the star collapses, uh, most of the star is ejected and you get a bright light, which is a supernova. And uh, in the lower right hand side, you see the most recent supernova to have occurred in or close to our galaxy. It actually occurred in the larger Magellanic cloud and the signal reached us in 1987. So as I mentioned, uh, when a supernova occurs, 
it blasts out uh, a lot of material and many of the heavy nuclei that, that we are made of and that we see around us on earth were actually formed by these supernova explosions. So here we're going up across the top we have the atomic numbers of uh, nuclei going from one from hydrogen to hydrogen up to 92 for uranium. And uh, in the lower picture, we have a typical uh, nuclear table, which has been colored according to the possible origin of those nuclei. So the ones which are colored green are produced by the explosions of massive stars. Uh, there are other sources of interest, like, for example, merging neutron stars are thought to form some very heavy elements. Uh, white dwarf stars, very small stars, are also important in some cases. Now, I mentioned that a supernova is formed when it's burnt all the fuel that it can, and it has an iron core. So iron, of course, has uh, atomic number 26. It's uh, a very common element. And uh, it's an isotope of iron that will be an important part of the story that I'm going to tell. So I want to connect uh, these supernova explosions with mass extinctions of life on Earth. So this picture here shows you uh, the percentage of uh, life forms, marine life forms, that were wiped out uh, as a function of time. So what you see is that there's not a sort of gradual dying out of life forms. Instead, what seems to happen is that every once in a while, there is a massive wipeout of a large number of life forms a so-called mass extinction. So the biggest one of these uh, occurred about 250 million years ago, and uh, that wiped out something like 95% of uh, life forms on Earth. And it occurred at the boundary between the Permian, shown at the top in red, and the Triassic period, shown in purple. Now. That's actually not the best known extinction. The best known extinction is one that occurred about 67 million years ago. And that's when the dinosaurs were wiped out. But that's just you know, one example, uh, the most dramatic uh, example of a mass extinction. So, so what might have caused the uh, deaths of the dinosaurs? Now, as I said, I'm interested in uh, supernovae. Uh, is it possible that there might have been a supernova close to Earth that could have caused a mass extinction? Perhaps not the dinosaurs, but perhaps something else. So this graph here shows you the distribution of distances to 10 to the fifth solar uh, supernovae. I uh, remind you that there's uh, something of the order of 10 to the 11 stars in the galaxy. And it's reckoned that over his of the history of the galaxy, there have been something like 10 to the 8 supernovae. Now, as I'll argue in just a moment, a supernova within about 10 parsecs, something like 30 light years of Earth, could have caused, or if it occurred in the future, would cause a mass extinction. This is because such a supernova emits a lot of radiation, which is, which would destroy the ozone layer that protects us from the sun's ultraviolet radiation. And estimates are that a supernova that close could have occurred every few hundred million years. So if you remember the uh, picture of mass extinctions on the previous slide, uh, you know, there's lots of mass extinctions over a period of a few hundred million years. Maybe one or more of those might have been due 
to a supernova explosion. Of course, in order for that to happen, the supernova explosion would have had to occur very close to Earth, down in the bottom left-hand corner of, uh, of this picture. So let's look a little bit at the uh, possibility of a nearby supernova explosion. So as you know, our galaxy has the form of a, of a disk. Uh, we are located uh, in, in that disk uh, about uh, 8,000 uh, parsecs away from the center of the galaxy. And any star that was within something like 10 uh, parsecs could have done severe damage to life on Earth. So it's possible to estimate uh, how many, uh, what the distance might be for a supernova on what time scale. And uh, what you see here is roughly speaking, every 10 mega years or so, we might have expected uh, one event, something like 30 parsecs away. So, so again, I repeat, there could have been many supernova explosions within 10 parsecs over the last 4.5 giga years since the Earth was formed. So was it a supernova that killed off the dinosaurs? Well, we believe that uh, dinosaurs were killed off by an astrophysical event, but not by a supernova. So in 1980, uh, this very famous paper appeared by uh, Louis Alvarez, Walter Alvarez, Frank Cassaro, and Helen Michel, and they analyzed the uh, transition uh, between the Cretaceous and the tertiary geological epochs, what did they find? So they found evidence for a killer asteroid impact. Actually, uh, they were looking for evidence of a supernova, but that's not what they found. What they found is a planet-wide layer of iridium. And uh, iridium is a, uh, an element which is found uh, quite copiously in asteroids. Now, they, were, they looked also for traces of plutonium-244. They didn't find it, and that was actually one of the reasons why they thought that this was not a supernova that caused the demise of the dinosaurs. Actually, I, I'm not sure that they had enough sensitivity to have seen traces of a supernova, but we'll come back to that later on. Anyway, it's now generally accepted that the event that killed off the dinosaurs was indeed due to an asteroid impact, and we even know where that asteroid hit. It hit on the uh, north side of the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, and in the bottom right right hand picture there, you can see uh, annular geological anomalies that correspond to the uh, sort of waves created in the Earth by that impact. So, of course, the, the dinosaurs didn't know what hit them, and they died off. Uh, nowadays, we human beings can maybe analyze astrophysical uh, possibilities for mass extinctions, and uh, maybe we can take evasive action or, or mitigate the effect of such an astrophysical event. I think this is a very good example of how scientific ignorance is dangerous. The dinosaurs didn't know about asteroids or supernovae, and they're not here anymore. So I got interested in this subject in uh, 1993. Uh, I'd been working with uh, David Schramm, who was a, a very well-known astrophysicist, on, on other topics to do with supernovae. But we got interested in the possibility that such a nearby supernova might have caused a mass extinction. 
So the first thing you think of is, well, a supernova emits a lot of light. So it's a flash of gamma rays. Now, the optical light is not harmful for the biosphere, although higher energy photons, gamma rays, might be more dangerous. What could also be more dangerous is the increased flux of cosmic rays. So uh, some of these are neutral, some of them are charged, and the uh, number of such cosmic rays can be many times larger than the normal cosmic ray flux. So what this excess of cosmic rays could have done was destroyed the ozone layer that protects us from the solar ultraviolet radiation uh, by virtue of producing nitrous oxide. And if you kill off the ozone layer, uh, that's bad for land life, it's bad for plankton, uh, and it's therefore bad for marine life. Of course, there would also be deposition of uh, other ejected material like dust, uh, but this is thought to have a small effect on sunlight. However, that dust deposited by the supernova on Earth could have an interesting observable signature, which is one of the topics that I've been working on for the last 25 years or so. So, concretely, uh, we suggested that geophysicists look for radioactive rain deposited on Earth by a nearby supernova. So the first paper I wrote on this subject uh, was in 1996, uh, together with uh, Dave Schramm and his then student, uh, Ryan Fields. So a, a dangerous supernova, one that could cause a mass extinction, would have to have gone off within 10, mile, 10 parsecs or so of Earth. But there will be something like 100 or 1,000 times more supernovae within 100 parsecs. They wouldn't have been close enough to have dramatic effects on the Earth's biosphere, but they would probably occur every few million years, and the dust they deposited could contain detectable amounts of unstable or live nuclear isotopes. Now, short-lived isotopes could not have survived since the origin of the solar system. If you see an isotope with a lifetime of a few million years or even a few tens of millions of years, it must have been formed in a recent astrophysical event. And we proposed looking for such radioactive rain as a smoking gun for a recent nearby supernova. Of course, when I say recent, <laughs> I mean within the last few million years. And when I say nearby, I mean you know, within 100 parsecs. So one of the elements that we focused attention on was this isotope of iron with an atomic weight of 60. So this is produced relatively copiously, we think, in supernova cores. So I remind you that the end stage of fusion processes in a star is an iron core. And uh, on the left here, I have another sort of onion picture of the interior of an old star. As you go down through the various different layers, you find heavier and heavier nuclei until eventually you get the iron in the middle, which cannot be fused anymore. So that is iron 56, the dominant isotope. But some of it will be iron 60. And in the right hand picture, you see some calculations of the amount of produced and ejected iron 60 on the vertical axis as a function of the mass of the collapsing star. So for a typical star mass of the order of 20 solar masses, you see a fraction of the order of 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5 
of iron 60 uh, ejected during the explosion. So iron 60 is not the only interesting isotope. Uh, and there's a, a list of uh, quite a number of isotopes with lifetimes less than a, a few hundred million years, uh, ranging from uh, beryllium 10 to uh, manganese 53, iron 60, iodine 129, all the way up to plutonium 244. Now, at the time when we wrote our original paper, uh, there was some uh, anomalous deposition of beryllium-10 reported in ice cores from 35 and 60,000 years ago, maybe also in deep ocean sediments. I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, it, it could have been produced uh, by spallation of uh, during nuclear collisions with cosmic rays, although it could also have been produced directly by a supernova. But in this case, there are significant backgrounds. So apart from beryllium-10, we also did calculations for a number of other isotopes, including in particular iron-60 and plutonium-244. OK, so um, has there been radioactive iron raining down from the sky? So this is a, a poster of a very bad science fiction movie, which came out some years ago, uh, where there's a group of Nazis who uh, set up uh, a city on the backside of the moon. Well, fortunately, that is science fiction. But what I'm going to present to you now is not science fiction. It's concrete evidence for iron 60 deposited on Earth in the last few million years. Now, I might mention that the half-life of iron 60 is 2.6 million years ago. So, if you see any iron 60 on Earth, it could not have been produced, let's say, 100 million years ago. That would have decayed. It has to have been produced relatively recently. So the pioneers in the search for iron 60 are a group from the Technical University of Munich who uh, use a technique called accelerator mass spectrometry. And what they did was to analyze deposits under the ocean in so-called ferromanganese crusts and deep ocean sediments. So here's a picture of a ferromanganese crust. It's, I know, it looks a little bit like volcanic lava. It's you know, quite a metallic solid lump. And then here on the right, we have a picture of a typical piece of deep ocean sediment, which you know, looks rather like some sort of solidified lump of sand. So what did the Munich group find? So they reported an excess of iron 60 in deep ocean ferromanganese crusts. So these crusts are laid down very gradually in, in layers. And so depending on how far down you go, then you're going back in time. And what you see in the upper picture is that there is an excess of iron 60, in particular in sediments, so in crust laid down within the last five or so million years, which I've highlighted uh, with this red oval here. And the strongest signal for this iron 60 actually was in the last three million years. So that's the time scale on which we think that there was a recent nearby supernova explosion. So 
Following that initial discovery, uh, the Munich group and others uh, did more measurements. And uh, here are some data from a paper by the same team in uh, 2004. And now you see a nice peak around 2.5, 3 million years ago. Uh, just exactly the sort of thing that one might have expected from a nearby supernova, which would have to have taken place about 3 million years ago. So, how can one interpret that iron 60 signal? So, uh, as I said, I've been working on this subject uh, off and on uh, ever since we made our initial proposal. And uh, this actually is a picture taken from a paper that Brian Fields and I wrote with Brian Fields, then student Brian Fry, back in 2014. So, you have the supernova, it explodes, and it sends a sort of shock wave out into the interstellar medium. And at the front of this shock wave, you would have a relatively large amount of material, and then there will be a sort of tail going back behind the shock wave. And this is a so-called Sedoff profile uh, rising from the dispersion of the blast wave as it propagates through the interstellar medium. So in this particular instance, uh, we took uh, an example of a shock wave which occurred, uh, so which was triggered by a supernova explosion about uh, between 2.2 and 2.3 million years ago. And then you get various different shapes for the uh, profile of the wave as it comes through uh, depending on how heavy was the mass of the progenitor supernova. So uh, this actually fits uh, quite well with the data. So uh, here we see the peak, which was being, being observed experimentally. Uh, in addition to the data from the original Munich group, here I also show as uh, open squares data from another group that uh, confirmed their measurements. And with a bit of imagination, you might imagine, well, there is a sort of tendency to see a sort of tail in the uh, pulse uh, after uh, the initial deposition. Okay, so it's great to see iron 60. But if you really want to confirm the interpretation, you would like to see other uh, isotopes of different elements. And uh, here are some calculations from our 2004 paper. Uh, so we've got a couple of different supernova models, one on the left, one on the right. And we study a bunch of uh, different possible isotopes manganese, uh, aluminium, samarium, hafnium, and plutonium. And uh, a couple of particularly interesting elements are manganese, uh, isotope 53, and plutonium 244 that I mentioned previously. So, so I, I might just mention that following the initial iron 60 discovery, more recently there has been evidence for the deposition of both manganese-53 and plutonium-244 on Earth. So, of course, the first question you might ask is, would this supernova that went off two or three million years ago, would it have been dangerous? And uh, the answer is no. So uh, you can estimate how far away it would have been uh, You've got a model for what the supernova progenitor was and how much iron 60 was ejected. Then you can figure out how far away it would have been. And the typical answer is about 100 parsecs. So that's a long way beyond the kill distance, which you can see down the bottom is about uh, 10 parsecs. So 
this supernova would not have been dangerous. It's not surprising that we're still alive. So that, that was the picture until uh, a few years ago. And then there was what I can only describe a, a barrage of new data, which confirmed this observation of iron 60, not just on Earth, but also on the moon. So as I mentioned, uh, the, the Munich and other teams looking for iron 60 examined deep oceans sediments and ferromanganese crusts. And uh, in 2016, there was a paper that did a more complete study of such deep ocean deposits. Uh, here you can see uh, their ge geographical locations. So the previous samples were indicated by those yellow stars and the new samples are in illustrated by these blue circles. So this iron 60 has now been seen in all the world's major oceans and in both the northern and the southern hemisphere. So uh, putting it all together, you see clear evidence for this uh, pulse between two and three million years ago, which we assign to at least one supernova and well, there's a little bit of uh, debate about the uh, date calibration, but the fact that there was a signal, this is well established. What's interesting also is that the 2016 paper claimed to find some evidence for another supernova in the more distant past between seven and eight million years ago. Uh, but uh, this remains to be confirmed. The same year, people from the Munich group analyzed lunar rock samples brought back by Apollo astronauts. So as you know, 1969, the early 1970s, there were several Apollo missions to the moon which brought back samples of lunar rock and dust. And Analysis of their data, uh, of their samples, showed a significant excess of iron 60 in several of the samples. So here you see, circled in red, uh, that there were a number of samples which had more iron 60, that's on the vertical axis, than what you would have expected. Unfortunately, of course, uh, the data from the moon doesn't give us precise timing information. Uh, perhaps in principle one could get some timing information by doing a more careful geological study of the moon. I'll come back to that later. Now one of the particularly amusing uh, sidelights on this is the fact that iron 60 has been observed not just in random samples of sediment or crusts, but specifically in magnetotactic bacteria. So these are bacteria that navigate by orienting themselves along magnetic field lines. So they live near the water sediment interface and uh, they want to be close to the surface. And what they do is they <coughs> absorb iron and with the magnetic iron, they follow uh, magnetic field lines. Those field lines are not horizontal they're inclined at an angle. And so by following the field line, you can find your way to the surface of the sediment. And uh, these are some micrographs showing crystals of iron containing magnetite in uh, those bacteria. 
And what Ludwig et al. found also in 2016 was a peak in iron 60 in those magnetotactic bacteria. So uh, I mentioned plutonium a few times, and uh, there have actually been several searches for live plutonium that might come from a supernova. Now, plutonium is interesting. It's different from iron in a couple of ways. It has a, a longer half-life. Uh, it lives for 81 million years, and it's produced in a different way. It can be produced in supernovae, but it can also be pr produced in the uh, mergers of neutron stars. Calculations suggest that you would see less plutonium. So you can calculate how much plutonium you would see if the iron 60 signal was also responsible, whatever produced the iron 60 signal was also responsible for the plutonium. And Valner et al. did find some plutonium, but it's less than the expected production by supernovae. So here on the right-hand side, you can see their data. And in the crust and the sediment, you see a non-zero amount of plutonium, but less than you'd expect if the plutonium and the iron 60 had the same source. So they interpret this as meaning that the production sites for plutonium are relatively infrequent and rare. Uh, like I said, maybe neutron star mergers. Okay, so we've got evidence from iron 60 of a nearby supernova. Where was that supernova? So there are two groups of stars called associations, which have been proposed as possible origins of that iron 60 signal. Uh, there's one which is uh, in the constellation Scorpio. And there's one which is another region of the sky called the Tucana Horologium Association. So what you see here are the uh, stars which are believed to belong to that association, that group of stars. So what we did a, a few years back was we did a more refined estimate of the distance to the progenitor supernova. And we found maybe a better fit to the Tuck Hall, the Tucano Horologium Association, than to the Scorpius Centaurus uh, Association, which was rather further, further away. You see, all our distance estimates are less than 100 parsecs, which corresponds to the Tuck Hall distance, whereas Skosen is a factor of two further away. So we wondered a little bit whether you could actually do astronomy with iron 60. So what happens when the iron 60 approaches the earth? Well, it comes into, as it comes into the solar system, <coughs> it passes through the heliosphere. And we found that <coughs> whichever direction it came from, it tends to retain that directionality until it reaches the neighborhood of the Earth. So that's shown here by the uh, red and blue lines, whose distances remain more or less the same as they come in from infinity and reach the Earth, which is represented by that little green uh, symbol there. The situation is also 
uh, the same when you consider the propagation of the supernova material through uh, the magnetosphere surrounding the Earth. Again, the good approximation, the directionality is retained. However, when you actually get into the Earth's atmosphere, then you lose directionality information because in particular, winds blow the dust around in the upper atmosphere and you lose the memory of the direction from which the iron 60 came. So this is a, a picture of the uh, locations of the measurements of iron 60 that I mentioned previously. And the colors here indicate what we would expect for the amount of deposition of iron 60 on the surface. You see that we would not expect so much in equatorial latitudes, we would expect more at high latitudes close to the poles, and it would be you know, more or less independent of longitude as you would expect. Well, that's not the end of the story because it, it come, the dust comes through the atmosphere, then falls into the water, and then it could be swept around by ocean currents. So the, the net result of all that is that on Earth, the uh, places where iron 60 is found cannot give us any, any information about where it came from. The same is not necessarily true of the distribution of iron 60 on the moon. So here are a couple of pictures of the moon uh, and uh, the little, little yellow spots are where the Apollo manned spacecraft landed. And the colors correspond to the uh, rate of deposition either for a supernova in the Skosen region or a supernova in the Tuck Hall region, assuming that the uh, Iron 60 continues in essentially the same direction all the way from production through to the moon, which is a reasonable uh, approximation, at least in some models. So what did the astronauts observe? So here shown in black are the uh, results from the Apollo uh, lunar sample returns. So as I mentioned, they, they saw iron 60 with large uncertainties because they didn't have very much uh, data to analyze. What you see is that uh, most of these Apollo landings occurred relatively close to the lunar equator. Now, in blue, we've got the latitude distribution expected from a Skosen supernova, and in green, that from a Tuck Hall supernova. So you see that in principle, there might be the possibility of distinguishing between the two if you could get measurements at very different latitudes, very high latitudes in the Northern Hemisphere and very low latitudes in the Southern Hemisphere. So as you remember, a couple of months ago, a Chinese mission unmanned went to the moon and brought back a sample of lunar material. That was a Chang'e 5 spacecraft, which landed 43 degrees north of the lunar equator. The Americans are planning landings near the lunar south pole in their so-called Artemis program. So these two landings certainly provide higher latitudes and 
with controlled sampling of their uh, material, one might hope to be able to distinguish possible origins for the iron 60 deposited on the moon. So here are a couple of pictures. The one at the top shows you uh, the view from the Chang'e 5 spacecraft. And the lower picture is uh, an artist's impression of what the American uh, base at the South Pole of the Moon might look like. So we've been in touch with the Chinese uh, scientists and we're hopeful that they will actually analyze their, their sample uh, to look for iron 60 and possibly other nuclei. And we've also proposed something similar for the Artemis mission. Now to finish, I, I would like to mention a paper that we wrote last year. So this is Brian Fields, uh, Adrian Mollot, uh, myself and some other co-authors. Do we have five fingers because of a nearby supernova? Well, that's not what the paper was called, but that's the way I like to phrase the question. The point is that towards the end of the Devonian period, about 360 million years ago, there was a big reduction in biodiversity. It wasn't one of the biggest mass extinctions, but you may have heard of the trilobites, which were a very prevalent life form for many hundreds of millions of years. They were basically wiped out by this end Devonian extinction. Where do fingers come in? Well, it turns out that before the end of the Devonian, animals had different numbers of digits. Some had five, some had seven, some had six. Afterwards, species with five fingers and five toes largely took over. So was that extinction of the trilobites and the non-five-fingered animals due to a nearby supernova? So this, just for uh, fun, is a, an image of a, a trilobite on the left, uh, one of the species that was wiped out. Uh, and on the right, uh, we have an image of some corals. So the type of coral changed significantly uh, between the Devonian and subsequent geological epochs. Now, we got interested in this because of uh, a paper that analyzed spores, so plant seeds, if you like, around the time of the end of the Devonian period. And what they found was that these spores, many of them were deformed or they were discolored. So here at the top left, you can see a, uh, a good spore, you know, nice spikes arranged regularly and looks pretty good. But if you look at some of the other pictures, you can see grossly malformed spores. Sometimes the spike is bent or it's not there at all. And in some cases, for example, bottom right, you see spores that were basically uh, black. And the interpretation would be that that happened because of ultraviolet radiation, which was allowed to Earth by the destruction of the ozone layer, which might, might have come from a nearby supernova explosion. So this was a possibility that we discussed in this paper that we uh, wrote last year. So this sort of supernova explosion would actually kill the ozone layer twice. First of all, with gamma radiation, subsequently with cosmic rays. And uh, the cosmic rays in particular would probably bathe the Earth 
uh, for up to 100,000 years and cause long-lasting ozone destruction. Uh, that would be a mechanism for mass extinction. In fact, you wouldn't only get uh, cosmic rays, you would all, uh, destroying the ozone layer, you would also get cosmic ray muons, which are penetrating radiation, which can go down to uh, a thousand meters into the ocean, and so they could kill uh, life forms quite deep underwater. So in our paper, we proposed uh, looking for various telltale isotopes, uh, including samarium, uranium, and uh, plutonium-244. And we estimated what the surface densities might be. And uh, we also estimated very approximately how far away such a supernova would have been, about 20 parsecs. So not close enough to kill off everything, but close enough to have a significant impact on Earth. So that brings me to the end of what I wanted to say. Uh, the discovery of iron 60 on ocean floors is I think the first discovery of a specific effect on Earth of an interstellar event. The first time we've seen evidence that distant astrophysical events can actually have an impact. Uh, and 60 has also been seen in lunar samples. Uh, there's also evidence from cosmic rays that I didn't have time to mention. So, so that supernova would not have been a threat to life on Earth. But a closer supernova could have been, and it's possible that a previous supernova explosion might have caused a mass extinction at the end of the Devonian epoch. And there's various ways in which you can look for possible evidence of that. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful presentation, sir. So I think students have learned a lot of things about the supernova and the matter of life and death. So if you allow, we can start our discussion session. We have got one guest with us. So Angon, can you uh, hear us? If you have yeah. question, we can ask our teacher. So welcome yeah. to our uh, webinar. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Hello. Sir, hello. Sir, can I ask my question? Please. Yeah, of course. Sir, my question is, is there any technology by which we can predict about future supernova explosions that can extinct human or life on Earth? Okay, well, <clears throat> yes, a very good question. So uh, a supernova doesn't happen just suddenly. Uh, for millions of years beforehand, uh, you can see the star evolving as it burns the various different uh, layers corresponding to various different uh, masses of elements. So you get plenty of warning. Then the question is, well, can you defend yourself against such an event? So one thing you could do is uh, you can defend yourself against the optical flash by not looking. Uh, defending yourself against the cosmic rays it, is more difficult because, as I mentioned, they would bathe the Earth for maybe 100,000 years. What you'd have to do is go live underground. The whole of civilization would have to go underground for that period of time. But I think that would be possible. I, I might mention, by the way, that there is no sign of any pre-supernova star anywhere near the Earth at the moment. So there's no immediate cause for worry. Thank you, sir, yeah. for giving us some time. Thank you, Ankon. We have another guest. Pratoy Ghosh uh, has connected with us. So uh, good, good evening. Uh, hello. So, welcome to our present. Good evening. Uh, so um, yeah, if you have uh, questions, you can ask. For the nice talk. Uh, so I'm not a student, I'm a condensed matter theorist, and I have a few things to clarify with you. Okay. Uh, so first of all, uh, when, when you said that 
you showed us the list of elements that that you are finding their abundance in Earth, like iron sixty or say plutonium two forty four. Uh, what uh, what made you choose those elements? I mean, what I want to ask is, uh, they have a finite lifetime, and you want to see the things that happened around the same time scale, and that's why you chose those elements. Okay, so so, so what we did was we did a systematic survey uh -huh. of uh, all the uh, isotopes with lifetimes between about a million years and a hundred million years. Oh. So, uh, so a million years, because we didn't expect an event to have occurred very, very recently. Uh, so if you're looking for something which occurred at least a million years ago, it's no good looking for an isotope that has a lifetime of 10,000 years. So we looked between a million years and then the upper limit was 100 million. Because if you have an isotope which has a lifetime of several hundred million years, that could have survived from the formation of Earth. So Earth was formed about 4.5 billion years ago. And we know, for example, that there is a uh, fixed percentage of uranium-235, uh, which is left over from the... Uh, formation of the solar system. So although you might see an excess of uranium-235, I think that's actually going to be very difficult. So, so the two elements that I focused on, iron-60 and plutonium-244, iron-60 has a lifetime of two and a half million years, plutonium about 81 million years. So these are you know, just in the sweet spot as far as the lifetime is concerned. Thanks. Uh, that brings me to my next question. After a supernova explodes, it takes a lot of time for those things to propagate to Earth. And things might decay in that. I'm, I'm just being a devil's advocate here. Uh, so, Right. So if the uh, supernova is within 100 parsecs of Earth, the amount of time taken from the propagation is not more than of the order of 100,000 years, maybe a few hundred thousand years. So that's short compared with the uh, lifetimes of the isotopes that we're interested in. Um, but indeed, you've got a good point there. That's a reason for not being interested in isotopes that only live for 10,000 years, because even if they were produced in the supernova, they probably wouldn't reach us. Thanks. You're welcome. Thanks for joining with us. So uh, we have uh, some question in inbox. So I would like to ask first question. So can dark matter and dark energy produce in supernova explosion? Is it possible? No, I don't think so. So, so uh, okay. supernovae are, are produced exclusively by you know, the standard type of matter that we know about that's described by the standard model. Uh, dark matter is by its nature uh, weakly interacting. In particular, it doesn't emit light. So it, it clusters relatively weakly compared with ordinary matter. Uh, so I don't think it has any impact on the formation of supernovae. Okay. Thank you, sir. So this may be the last question. So how Neutrino will help us to know more about the supernova? Sorry? So how Neutrino will help us to know more about the supernova explosion? Neutrino will help us. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is a very interesting uh, question. So... Uh, as you know, uh, there was a supernova observed in 1987, uh, also by the emission of neutrinos. And by correlating observations in neutrinos with observations uh, using visible light and other optical radiation, 
one can understand much better the mechanism for a supernova. For example, uh, was it isotropic or was it irregular? Uh, so it, this, uh, this standard picture that we have here is uh, not spherically symmetric. Right? And uh, so people are now trying to uh, simulate non spherically symmetric uh, supernova explosions. And by observing the neutrinos, we can in principle infer the, what type of uh, non spherical explosion took place. I, I might mention also that I, I just talked uh, very simply about one type of supernova, core collapse supernovae. In fact, there's various different types of supernovae. And uh, you can, in principle, distinguish between them by observing the uh, neutrinos that they produce. So thanks for wonderful presentation, nice discussion session, sir. So I think uh, students have learned a lot of things about the supernova. So the main aim of our program is to motivate and encourage our students. I think uh, we are trying our best to do that things. So thanks for accepting for the third time our invitation. So we'd like to say thanks on the behalf of the Department of Physics from the University of Science and Technology uh, for accepting our invitation, sir. So it was a very great webinar with you, sir. And hopefully we'll arrange another webinar with you. And after the COVID, I'll definitely invite you for a face-to-face -face session uh, to visit Bangladesh uh -huh. and our university. That will that be would more be very interesting. Nice. Um, yeah. I look for I look forward to it. So in the meantime, yeah. I wish you luck in uh, yeah. getting through the uh, yeah. pandemic and uh, yeah. wish you well for the future. Thank you, sir. Bye for today. Okay, goodbye. Bye. Thank you, sir. Goodbye.